gospel lesson today is from the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 34 through 37, which can be found on page 44 in your New Testament. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Just to refresh our memory, Hurricane Katrina hit the, uh, the coastal lands of Mississippi and Louisiana on August the 28th and 29th of 2005, almost eight years ago. The heavy rain and the high winds caused a great deal of damage, but most of the damage that was caused in those coastal communities in the Mississippi and Louisiana area was caused by the enormous flood surge that moved inland devastating many of the coastal communities of Mississippi and also hitting New Orleans. What caused a lot of the problem there, though, was the massive failure of the levee system that had been built in New Orleans years earlier in order to protect the city from exactly that type of hurricane event. Eighty percent of the city went underwater from a few feet to many, many feet, and that was almost eight years ago. When I went down there on this mission trip, I did expect to still see, eight years later, the results of that hurricane. I did not expect to see the dozens, if not hundreds, of still abandoned homes and businesses that have just been left standing there after these years that are rotting and decaying all over the city. I expected to work because we went down on a mission trip. But I did not expect to work on a middle-class brick home in a middle-class neighborhood in a house like many of us live in and I did not expect on that street and in that neighborhood to see many other homes that have just been left standing and abandoned, that have never been touched in the almost eight years since Katrina, that are just left there. You'll have four or five really nice houses that are very well kept and the yards are immaculate and next to it a completely abandoned home which has grown up and falling down. I did expect to eat, you know, but I did not expect to enjoy the, the cuisine of New Orleans. I had never eaten red beans and rice before. You know what? They're really good. <laughs> I enjoyed the gumbo. And kind of being a Midwest meats and potato kind of guy, I was honestly surprised by that. They even got me to eat grits on the last day. <laughs> and you know what? I like grits. I didn't know that. I lived all my life and didn't know that. I expected to laugh because I'd been on these trips before, but I never expected to laugh so much and so long and so hard as I did with this amazing group of people that I had the privilege to travel with. And I expected to mourn because I've seen it before. But I did not expect to hear the story after story after story of people who in a few hours lost all the belongings of their lives. The story of one elderly African-American man who was rescued by helicopter from the floodwaters 
and was taken to an Air Force base in Texas and dropped off there. Didn't know where he was, was there for three months. With nothing, he arrived with nothing but the clothes on his back, was not allowed to return to his home or what was left of his home for over a year after that. I was not prepared for the lady who, after paying her bill at a restaurant in which we were eating, walked out in the parking lot and saw our church van there, realized we were a volunteer group that had come down, came back into the restaurant, found our group sitting together at a table, and told us her story of how she had lost everything in the flood and how it was groups like ours who had returned there time after time after time again who had given back her home and her life. And she said, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for still coming all this time later and helping other people put their lives back together. I expected when we left that the group would have a spirit of cooperation and charity. I honestly did not expect it would last all week. (laughs) You know what? And I was wrong. As we unloaded in the rain on the parking lot here at 6 o'clock last night, that spirit of cooperation and charity was still present in the midst of that group. And I give thanks to God for that. Some of you may be wondering kind of what we were doing, or I mean, kind of where we were. And where we stayed was a place called Camp Restore, and they have a website. You can go look it up. And it was actually a Missouri Synod Lutheran church. It had been flooded during Katrina. Most of the congregation had left. They were down to about 10 people after Katrina. Those 10 people voted to keep the church open. And when they did, the Missouri Synod denomination came to them and said, we would like to use your facility, partnering with you to serve the volunteers coming into New Orleans to rebuild. That has been the mission of that congregation for almost eight years now. Most of their sanctuary is a dining hall. They have a kitchen and a trailer next door that they eat out of. They had built a school, and all of the volunteers stay in the school, which they have adapted to serve the needs of the volunteers. We were down there last week with, I don't know, 60, 70 other people, two other groups, a large high school group, another group from Wisconsin and ourselves down there. They are equipped to serve up to 300, and we were glad there wasn't 300 there. Because it wasn't real crowded, but there was plenty of people there for us, at least from me. But it was a great time. They are the last remaining mission of that type in the reconstruction of New Orleans after Katrina. And they have served thousands and thousands of volunteers and worth seller thousands more this summer as they continue to come from all over the United States. As I've thought about our experience, I think one of the questions that we always need to ask ourselves is why did we go? Why did we go? We all paid to go. And why? Why why do we do that type of thing? Why is it a part of the life of many Christian communities? Why is it a part of ours now? And as I asked myself that question and began to ponder the answers, there were lots of reasons, dozens of them really. I think part of it is just the fact that vibrant churches send out mission groups all over and that's what we want to be and so we did that. I think it's because maybe some people wanted to go and they just wanted to help and serve. And that was something they just felt like they wanted to do and it was an opportunity and so they took a hold of that opportunity to go help and serve. I think some of them may have just had a longing for gumbo and red beans and rice, and that's the best place to go and get it, and so they went along. I think there was others who have heard about this type of experience all their lives, 
and never really had an opportunity to do it. And so they said, I want to go. I want to go and experience what something like this is like. There are dozens of other reasons. But I think there's an underlying reason behind all of them. And for me, that is simply the fact that God calls us to go. God calls us to go. And I don't mean by that that there is an audible voice that tells people, you need to go on this mission trip, although there may have been that for some. They didn't share that with me. But, but what I mean by that is simply that at the core of what it means to be a Christian disciple is this paradox which was read in the Scripture this morning. We read it from Mark. You could find it in Matthew. It's in other places in the New Testament. Where God simply lifts up the paradox that says, if you really want to live life, if you really want to understand what life is all about, then you need to give your life away. For the, for the more you hold to it, the closer you hold life, the less you will know of it. And the more you give it and share it, the greater your life experience will be. Those who will save their lives will lose them. And those who are willing to lose their lives by giving them away will find life and abundant life. I don't understand it, but I do believe it. I know it's true in my own life and in the experience of my lives. To be a Christian disciple and to take a step on that journey, at some point early in that journey, early in that walk, means I will serve. I will serve others. And I will serve others with some level of sacrifice in my life. I will give my time, I will give my energy, I will give my financial resources, I will give of my being in order to help someone else. And that is fundamental to discipleship. Fundamental to what it means a Christian disciple. Now that means a lot of different things. That can mean you go across your yard or you go across your street and you take something to a neighbor and it may be food or a card or simply an expression of help to serve them in that way. It may be going to the church and there at the church you teach a Sunday school class, or you sing in the choir, you usher on Sunday morning, or you run a video camera or a soundboard. You do one of the thousands of things that offer the operation and function of a church. You may serve a funeral dinner, or you may bring food that is served at that dinner. You may help feed those who have come to help us when we've had a disaster. All of that going is serving. All of that going is mission. You may go to Peoria or Florida or New Orleans. You may go to Honduras or Liberia, Africa. But if you are to be a Christian disciple, then somewhere, some way, you must Learn how to give your life away. How to give your life away. And I can't tell you how to do that. And I don't believe anybody else can either. I can offer you hundreds of ways to do it. But you must find a way to serve those who need to be served. 
and to give your life away for others. And when we do that, we find the life that God wants us to find and created us to live. The month of April has been an emphasis on mission. And we close that emphasis with this Sunday. I hope every one of you during this month has found at least some way to give your life away to others. And I encourage you to continue to do that as the days and weeks and months roll on. Next month, we start an emphasis on faith sharing, sharing our faith story, sharing our faith with others. And some of you have already said, I'm not doing that. And all I can say is, God really wants all of us to do it. God really wants all of us to partake in that. We're going to focus on that for a month. We've got a workshop to try to help equip you to do it. And we're going to move on. But don't forget mission, all right, folks? Don't forget to serve. Don't forget to give your life away to others. And in that find life, life, real life, Real joy, real purpose. Serving the God who invites us to serve and serving others. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you, Lord, for all that you have given us. For this month of emphasis, Lord, for the opportunity to serve in, in the hundreds of ways we find to serve. Lord, place that upon our hearts and our lives as we seek to give our lives away in service to you and others. In your name we pray. Amen.